Thank you so much for joining us. This is the Opportunities in Gaming panel. Um, obviously, we could talk about this for three or four hours and not get bored. And there's so many aspects that um, we're not going to be able to cover everything. That being said, we have a really wide variety of talent that have dealt with opportunities in gaming from licensing to activations to promotion with artists. Um, I'm going to let them kind of introduce themselves each and just give a quick background of where they work and what they do. Start with you, Pablo. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm excited to be here. My name is Pablo. I work at Beggars Group, um, representing five independent labels, Excel, Matador, 4AD, Young, and Rough Trade. And um, I'm the head of marketing there here in the U.S. And I guess the, the way our worlds kind of intersect here is we're always trying to find creative and budget-friendly ways to engage not only with the gaming community, but also to highlight the artist's creative vision in unique ways. So um, my sort of expertise or my uh, uh, contribution here is related to uh, finding uh, creative ways to gamify the music to the audience in some uh, in some sort of novel um, way out there, and you know to use uh, our resources as best as possible, and then also you know to find other opportunities um, within the fan base. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Epstein from Screenwave Media. Um, I run operations and head up music over at Screenwave and do a little bit of everything, <laughs> which is kind of um, this, my story from beginning to end. Um, we started off working with YouTube content creators, primarily in the gaming space, um, working with a lot of people in retro games, um, making um, pickup videos and, and stuff like that. And then I always like to say I accidentally fell into the music industry, but I love being here. Um, we started working with a lot of uh, YouTubers that were making um, either covers of video game music or were making original music about video games. So I just wanted to find them more resources in this space and take their YouTube audience and help it translate to other different areas of the internet and, and things like that. Um, so thanks for having me today. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Gavin, the head of gaming at Monster Cat. I also accidentally fell into both the uh, music and gaming uh, industry randomly online, which is great. Um, but uh, my role is I'm the head of gaming uh, at, at Monster Cat, and I run, I've been building and leading the uh, gaming division here for the past 10 years. Um, primarily all the sync and partnerships uh, at the company as well, including my team. Uh, we have been growing in the gaming space for quite some time, working with a lot of long-term partners such as Fortnite, uh, Rocket League, Beat Saber, Roblox, uh, and High res Studios recently with Smite and Paladins. Uh, we're really about just uh, artist sustainability and building long-term impactful partnerships uh, for our artist roster so that we're able to provide artist sustainability across our whole roster, providing opportunities that might be usually reserved for the AAA artists, but making sure that we can provide opportunities for all the roster of all sizes uh, so that everybody can be included and, and have these opportunities that are, are for them within the gaming industry. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Maxwell, and I'm the uh, Senior Director of Label Development and A&R at Idle. Uh, we're a digital distributor based in France. Um, we have offices uh, in Nashville, LA, uh, London, um, Germany, and Johannesburg. Uh, and we're a little bit different than most distributors because we take kind of a selective approach to the labels that we sign. Um, about five years ago, we got into working with uh, video game soundtrack labels. Uh, we're working with Ubisoft on a worldwide basis right now, uh, as well as Bandai Namco, a label called Brave Wave out of Japan. So, um, you know, video games aren't the only thing we distribute, but uh, yeah, happy to be here and uh, excited to uh, talk to the, the experts about this. So to get started, um, literally a question about getting started. There's a ton of desire from the labels, from independent artists, from publishers, just to you know get started in the metaverse, in the gaming space. So how did you guys first open that door? Yeah, I can, I can start there. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, quite a little bit of an origin story, I guess. Uh, so Monster Cat started at a very interesting time uh, back in 2011 and especially 2012 where uh, gaming was, especially esports and content creation on YouTube and Twitch and soon to be Mixer, uh, started gaining uh, popularity. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of uh, 
questionable uh, things about music rights and content ID started popping up uh, with the with content ID really taking over YouTube. Uh, there was a real need for uh, accessible music uh, within the gaming industry. Uh, that's because if a content creator was to uh, be claimed or be striked, or they'd get in hot water with not just uh, with YouTube itself, and they would lose full monetization on that video, which would be at the time with, when there wasn't a lot of sponsorships and things like that for content creators, that would be their entire uh, revenue stream wiped out. Uh, so uh, I knew a bunch of pro gamers at the time through just online gaming uh, over Twitch, and I presented the idea to uh, Monster Cat, and they're like, I was 18 years old at the time, and they were just like, okay, kid, just try this out. Uh, so uh, I started mass reaching out to uh, YouTubers and, and Twitch streamers, and they loved it. Uh, it provided quality music for their videos. Um, that, that was where I started learning what licensing actually was at the time. In my mind, it was just giving the music away or in return for exposure. Uh, but uh, it really gave a, a stage for our artists to be discovered where it was really difficult to be discovered as an artist at that time. Uh, and with the, in a couple years, we onboarded thousands of content creators, uh, both on YouTube uh, and Twitch. And with that initial uh, foundation of people discovering Monster Cat through like the YouTube descri descriptions and like streamers shouting us out on Twitter and social media, that got the attention of the esports teams, the production studios, all of the conferences, uh, the platforms themselves. Uh, and then that's what eventually got us into the door with the, the game developers and the publishers. Uh, so it was really about um, finding our initial niche within an industry and how we could solve a problem which was really needed at the time to then give us that foothold and, and trust and like making yourself endemic within the space uh, so that you can then uh, have that um, ability to uh, have that inbound and also go out to conferences and whatnot um, to be discovered uh, through the greater industry. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's where we got, we got started there. I had a little bit of a similar story in some ways and, and very different in others where um, a game called Five Nights at Freddy's came on the scene. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's like a, a horror game where the animatronics at Chuck E. Cheese come alive and your job, you're like the night security guard. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? Um, but a, a lot of people really latched on to this game. This fandom became huge. And there were so many people creating content, whether it's animations or original music, which is kind of where we came in, um, about this fandom. And just seeing this, this audience and how no matter what you would put out, they would watch it. They would consume this content. I mean, to the tune of 20, 40 million views per each song you would put out with an animation to go along with it. And I just didn't, I underestimated the power of a community like that and starting to bring in artists that were totally outside of this community and seeing them just gain this whole new audience. Now, there's a whole other issue where it's, okay, how do we get this audience here and bring it somewhere else? And um, that was a difficulty in the beginning for us, but finding a community that can really embrace and, and foster um, an artist is kind of where why we got into this. and. The gaming community really is special in that way where we have mo most of the most dedicated fans that I have ever seen because they not only are living in these gaming worlds, they're living outside of these gaming worlds and want more content. And there are so many opportunities that, that come along with that. And, you know, there's licensing, there's that opportunities, there's creating original compositions um, for these games, there are all those opportunities. But I think the real power for us has been in finding a fandom that you resonate with and really plugging in and, and giving them what they're asking for and engaging with them. Um, from our side, I mean, I guess the big question, you know, coming from the label side and the marketing side is how do we, uh, you know, how do we uh, build in gaming into a campaign cycle and, um, you know, have the music come to life um, in another format. So um, when I was at Columbia, before I was at Beggars, uh, Kill Screen Media um, magazine run by uh, Jamin Warren, who also then we subsequently worked with him uh, through his new company called 256, uh, which I highly encourage for 
people like me who are not as well versed in the gaming world, um, uh, we you know we did a, a research report with them to just kind of explore the opportunities. That's what they focus on, and I think that was kind of a good primer for those who feel uh, very sort of overwhelmed. But um, but back at Columbia, you know, Kill Screen had a opportunity. I mean, a partnership with Pitchfork and. You know, they did some really creative things with independent gamers, and um, uh, at the time it was Passion Pit. Uh, they licensed a song and they created essentially like a three-minute experience, um, and so that opened up the opportunity to kind of think of gaming in this like very niche and creative and independent world um, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, and in some ways budget it. You know, you always hear the opportunities out there of Travis Scott, and Fortnite, and Lil Nas X, and then these sort of big uh, companies who probably only touch the big artists. So for us, it's just like, how do we bring uh, a game experience uh, into a campaign and then make it feel organic? Um, and they, you know, in, in their research, um, a few things that kind of resonated, um, you know, they kind of approach it into three uh, pillars, the play, share, and experience. Play is like in-game collaboration, share. Obviously, you deal with, you know, opportunities in the social uh, and then the broadcasting realm, Twitch and YouTube, there's opportunities there from a label side, which you don't have to actually make games, and then experience. Um, and we've also done a few sort of experience models where, you know, we partner with Baby Castles, this, um, you know, very homegrown and like, you know, artist collective here in New York, and we did a launch event. So for us, the question is like, how do we bring it to this campaign? And then the answer, if it fits, um, is, um, and I have a few slides later that I can share some of the things that we've done is, it's hopefully like where, how can we kind of tackle it in a very small approach uh, and make it fun for the audience. Um, so that's sort of been our approach and it's, it's, it's been fun and I think the artists like it because it's an extension of their creativity. I have a quick follow up question that like, how do you know when it's a good fit for a campaign? Sometimes, uh, you know, well, we used to work with Grimes. Obviously she's very connected with this world and a lot of those opportunities came from her camp and, you know, we just kind of tapped into it from a licensing side and or, you know, when she was appearing in a, um, an, an award show or, or you know, on Twitch, uh, you know, playing with her counterpart. Um, but sometimes it's just you kind of pitch it out to the artist and if they resonate, then you um, work uh, in a way that, you know, they don't have to really dig in too much, but it kind of fits creatively. Uh, so it really depends, but not everybody is gonna really like be prime for it. So um, it's like a once in a, you know, however many shots at it. And Thomas, like, but how did you get started? first open that first door? Yeah, on our end, I think a lot of it was uh, Ubisoft and just kind of like how we learned about that space through our work with them. There was a lot of ups and downs with, you know, dealing with what you were saying about like the content ID stuff and having to manage, you know, uh, what can and can't be delivered with content ID. And in that scenario, we actually created a separate YouTube channel and helped Ubisoft develop a brand around Ubisoft Music. Uh, which, you know, of course, then like would filter all the, the plays and streams directly from their official channel. Uh, and that kind of like alleviated that content ID uh, situation. But then on the other side of things, um, <laughs> we're working with a lot of labels that are uh, doing even music supervision for uh, video games. So rather than just licensing, they're actually like finding artists and having them, you know, I uh, guess play songs around the, the OST and the compositions. A good example of that is this week, the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge comes out. And uh, we've got Mike Patton from Faith No More singing the theme. And we have uh, Ghostface and Raekwon from, U U uh, from Wu-Tang uh, doing the final boss uh, battle, battle with uh, Shredder. So That's really cool. Um, yeah. Like 12 year old me is like, that's fucking, <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> So a little bit of a follow-up. What are some of the best practices for engaging with video game companies and first approaching them? Mm, um, I think it just comes down to the kind of work that we've done to bring a lot of these OSTs, you know, get more ears on them, get more eyes on them, uh, treating it like any other release. Uh, and it's a very specialized area. You know, there's a lot of like uh, metadata um, uh, nuances that you have to follow to make sure that things, you know, go smoothly. Uh, and I think that expertise kind of led to us being seen as like, oh, well, these guys can do that, you know, video game uh, music as well. Uh, it's definitely not the only thing that we work with. I mean, we're across all genres, um, but it's, uh, it's a fun one um, to have on board. Do you guys have any best practices you recommend? Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, we really focus on long-term partnerships uh, at MonsterCat when it comes to the, the gaming clients that we work with. Uh, so 
for a lot of them, such as Rocket League and, and high res, uh, we actually have open a lot of open communication, whether it be over weekly calls or bi-weekly calls. We have uh, shared Slack channels with Epic Games and various companies uh, so that we're always, uh, when, when it comes to even licensing, if it's just like a straight sync license or it's a, it's a partnership or a multi-month campaign that we're working on, whether it be for a Fortnite concert or something, like we always, you always want to make sure that your projects are not hindered creatively uh, and you're always keeping the artist and the opportunity first when you're building these sorts of campaigns and, and licenses. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of precedents both on the, the game developer and publisher side and also the rights holder side uh, that can really get in the way and can diminish the opportunity for the artist. And when you're able to have that open communication and you're talking at all times and working towards like the same goal, uh, you can really build a really impactful campaign from that that really achieves uh, like what the end user receives and creates like a real, uh, we call it like a magic moment for the gamers and they have a really great shared experience which then goes and blows up the artist even more. It brings longevity to the record. It creates that identity around the record or records that you're uh, working with. Um, so yeah, it, it's just trying to have as much open communication as possible and not get too much of the, the little details in the way that might hinder the project creatively so that you can build the best product possible. To piggyback on that a little bit too, like a lot of these independent developers don't know how music works. They don't know what types of rights are available. Um, they don't necessarily understand. So I think it's really important to really educate them and they're getting an opportunity to work with your artists and to find a new audience there. And you're getting an opportunity as an artist or a label to work in a space you've never worked in before or to have social media cross promotion with this developer that has put their, their heart, their soul, their everything into this project and maybe they've been working on it for a year maybe they've been working on it for five years and being put into that cycle is is an amazing moment but i think a lot of education needs to happen especially for the indies and i think it's it's on us it's it's on the music industry to be able to give them the tools to make it successful to make the soundtrack successful and i think in in exchange for your knowledge share and uh, of all of that, you're really gaining a lot of opportunities you wouldn't think about, but you have to make sure the developers on board understands what you're trying to do, understand how you're there to support the release. I mean, there's so many opportunities you wouldn't even think of to sell the video game with the actual soundtrack and to be able to have those opportunities like on Steam, when you buy a game on PC, on the Steam platform, you're able to sell the soundtrack right alongside with the game. So it's an easy sale for you if you're creating the soundtrack for that game. But the developers might not be thinking about that. So it's like as an artist um, working on this project or a label working on this project, you have to advocate for these things and teach them like what our community is like and um, really use your own numbers and your own push to show how you can help that game. And I think that is so important and something we need to focus on going into it, but you'll get so much out of it. Basically assume positive intent and be open to learning. Yeah. What about you, Pablo? Um, okay. Well, from our side, I mean, obviously on the licensing side, we, uh, my colleague, I don't want to represent for her, but, uh, you know, maintaining the relationships and expanding all the connections with any and available developer and, and um, you know, opportunity uh, from that end. Um, and of course, digging through um, to see what other examples. From our side, I think, uh, you know, what I mentioned before is sort of the three angles, like when we approach the marketing campaign, is like where can gaming fit uh, in this specific campaign? Play, share, experience. <laughs> Um, you know, if there's a play opportunity where we develop, you know, we modulate like an existing game in a creative way, then we approach it that way. Um, the share experience, you know, if the artist is into gaming, obviously figuring out ways to use YouTube and Twitch um, to kind of like get their brand and their music across that way. Uh, and then the experience, you know, we try to bring the the music uh, to real life as much as possible, even though that's going to hit a smaller sect of an audience. But um I feel like the connection is, it's, to me, is like more impactful. Um, so with the Baby Castle examples, we partner with Rat King, one of our artists, and we essentially build an arcade. Um, and we worked with some independent uh, game designers, and then they came in and they essentially like 
completely graffitied all the cabinets. So it became this like experience for three to four days where you could kind of immerse yourself into the Rat King world. And then they had a, a performance there. So there's all these ways that you can kind of play with gaming um, as part of your launch campaign. So uh, the best practice is like always ask the questions like in which element does it feel more natural to the artist and then like kind of dig in a little bit more. Um, and again, um, it's only going to work like maybe one out of 10, but um, always good to ask that question. So we've talked a lot about from a top down level of these types of opportunities and best practices, but I'd love to kind of go into detail a little bit more about specific activations you guys have done. Um, and I know a couple of you brought some pictures, examples, and so it'd be great to see that hopefully spark some ideas within the audience of what they can do. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, in general. Uh, so with with Monster Cat, I mean, we just to kick it right off. I mean, uh, our longest standing partnership was with Rocket League. Uh, we've been working with them for the past uh, five plus years, uh, being their premier music partner for the game. Uh, it started off originally just as a, a simple compilation album with 18 tracks, but it's quickly evolved into just like a multi-phase partnership with a lot of moving parts. Uh, we're, we've put over 100 songs in the game, and we're now dropping songs the same day in-game as we are on the record label. Uh, so we're almost co-launching co these records with Rocket League in-game, where the artists get their own flags, they're credited in the game. You can actually convert straight to Spotify from in-game from in -game as well. Uh, we've done campaigns as uh, the radio is just like the initial integration. If you're if you're an artist that's launching within Rocket League uh, and being like the lead song when you launch the game, uh, but we've also done branded cars. Uh, we've, there's now player anthems that you can buy where uh, anytime you score a goal or you become an MVP within the game, you're able to soundtrack. Uh, it's kind of, sort of like a rep your song or rep your own soundtrack for everybody who's in the the game at that time. Uh, we've also done um, multi-month campaigns uh, recently with uh, Cascade, where we dropped his most recent reset EP uh, over specific uh, marketing beats in-game, where it was the car dropped and his wheels and all that stuff dropped. Yeah. And then he crossed over into Fortnite, uh, where he did a radio takeover uh, on Radio Yonder. And then it's he got like emotes uh, in the game as well that you could purchase. And then it sort of like ended with a major uh, Rocket League X Fortnite uh, in-game concert, where in XR he's like playing in the festival world uh, that the season two at the time, uh, which then got ported into Fortnite. Uh, and you can check that out on on YouTube. Uh, there's other things we've done as well. Uh, we're starting to dive into battle passes, which is kind of like our most recent endeavor, uh, where uh, both with Smite and Paladins with Hi-Res Studio, incredible team. Uh, to where we're, and this is something that's available to our whole roster. It doesn't really matter if you're a AAA or, or whatnot, uh, but we're putting the artists as playable gods and, and, care, and champions within those games uh, within Monster Cat branded battle passes to where there's a ton of items that you can purchase that are Monster Cat branded, they're artist branded, uh, the likeness of the artist is included as the god skin, uh, but also uh, the stems of their songs that we're also launching within the game uh, on release day are uh, the stems, like when you're shooting a fireball or, or your ultimate ability, uh, it's actually playing pieces of the song in a really creative way that's unique to the game itself. Um, so yeah, there's like emotes, purchasable items, microtransactions, we're doing music packs within Beat Saber as well, uh, and partnering with a ton of other rhythm games. There's just so much opportunity. It's really just the uh, how far both the creative vision mutually is between uh, label or yourself and the partner that you're working with or the developer or publisher that you're working with. Uh, we've also done a ton of things outside of the game too. Uh, so we've done like esports tournaments with Team Liquid. Uh, we've done uh, sh nightclub shows at gaming festivals as well, which we call Monster AFK, which our artists can also be front and center with the gaming industry, but also get the Monster Cat, uh, kind of buy a drink for the whole industry as well and really show what Monster Cat is beyond just a 10 by 10 booth. Um, so there's so much opportunity out there in the gaming space, and there still is. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to do. There's a couple of photos behind you if you just wanted to run Yeah, through. so that's Cascade playing within Rocket League. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was like a five-day shoot, um, but it, it really was an incredible product. We actually used XR, which is the same uh, tech. This is actually like in the same area that The Mandalorian was shot. Um, so it's using like this new technology that's in partnership with, with Epic Games.
think the next one was the Paladins one, which is probably my favorite activation you guys have done in a hot minute. Thank you. <laughs> I want my artists to be a... Yeah, boxes. and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, so we're really excited to work with high res further on, on their titles. That's Rocket League, yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is something we recently did with Throttle. Uh, so uh, we re he was... Uh, we launched his EP, the Where You Are EP, back in 2019, where it was uh, alongside the anime season when Throttle himself was going through an anime rebrand. Uh, so we brought that together, and the Rocket League community really grabbed hold of Throttle himself. They actually called him the green guy, which is whatever it worked. Um, but uh, we then brought it back uh, recently for Rocket League's new animation season. Uh, now that they've gone free to play, they've kind of reset their seasons. Uh, so he got his own car. Uh, th we actually launched his music video, his anime music video alongside this launch as well. And then he got like his own car and wheels and player anthems and all that stuff. And the Rocket community was super excited for him to return. Cool. Yeah, this is just highlighting a, a slushy um, campaign we did. Uh, it was a Fortnite concert back in 2020. Uh, this is when he launched the song, uh, All, All I Need. Uh, and it actually became a, a meme as the Rocket League intro song, and it absolutely blew up. It's done tens of millions of streams across all platforms since. Uh, so again, just like tying moments, creating magic moments around records that bring longevity to them through gaming. Yeah, and that's the Smite Battle Pass. Uh, so we had Slushy, Sullivan King, Coven, and then I don't know if you're familiar with Crab Rave, but it's like a super popular internet meme. Uh, we launched that on Monster Cat and brought Crab Rave to life as a playable crab god <laughs> uh, in the game. Tons of fun. I think that's it. Yeah. So yeah, any other? like? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, yeah, if you want to. Which is going to be completely the opposite of this, so brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Cutting edge graphics. Um, Listen to about it. But you know, this this is sort of what I was talking about. So K Trinata, uh, we worked the first record uh, 99 percent, and um, we just essentially, uh, and again, I hope there are no lawyers here, but um, you know, copied Flappy Birds uh, and then applied the graphics from the artwork. So this was just a creative way to launch a track when you completed it over a certain amount of points. I forgot how many you unlocked the track. So um, that was just a great way again to apply gaming to the launch of a song, um, and then. Uh, which is still sitting in our office. So if anybody ever comes to our office, we built the cabinet. Um, and when he came through to Terminal 5, we had the cabinet in there. Um, he himself went out into the crowd and was playing with uh, his fans. So, you know, again, bringing online real world. Um, so if you go to the next one, let me see what else I have. Oh, so this is the Rat King event that we did. Uh, they spent like two days essentially graffitiing the entire place. Um, we had to pay a lot of money to get it back into shape, but it was a great experience. Uh, it was about, you know, 100 degrees in there, and, you know, it was open for four days, and they essentially did their uh, launch uh, performances there. So that was, again, a way to bring gaming in a unique way. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh, this is not our example, but um, I love this one, King Gizzard, Lizard Wizard. They, uh, again, similar thing. They Essentially, I think it's a, a Doom mod. Um, for their launch of their Infest the Rastnet, and, um, or, you know, a first-person shooter, essentially, and, again, uh, putting music in the video game. Uh, next one. Oh, um, again, uh, legal-wise, please. Um, Tetris. <laughs> I know we can't call it Tetris, but um, Black Midi, huge Tetris fan, so we, we created Block Midi for Black Midi, our artist. Um, we did a, a MIDI version of their song um, and uh, went out. This just happened three days before the track launch, so fans could uh, engage with the song uh, in a unique way. Um, uh, and supposedly they're going to reward the fan with the highest amount of uh, points, um, but it's uh, an unachievable uh, number, so it's kind of a, a play on you know how far you can get. So another example of... Um, and the way we've developed these, some of them have been our in-house, you know, web developers. There's a lot of open source code out there that you can just modulate, and it just becomes super easy and cost effective for you to engage um, in, in some fun ways with play. I have a couple other ones, I think. Uh, next one. Oh, uh, Wiki from Wrecking as well. We did a Mario mod um, 
So um, because the album was about New York, so we essentially created a whole New York uh, experience. That's uh, cool. And then the next one, um, Yeji. Um, she actually designed and developed this um, uh, Jufa's uh, world. Um, again, hit a song um, in it. There's a character, Wufa, in her record. So, you know, this is just, again, a simple way for, for her to have sort of displayed her creative uh, vision um, and very, very homegrown. Um, and I think I have a couple more just quickly going through in the interest of time, just so you guys kind of. Um, oh, yeah, Lombardi's World. Uh, One Trait Danger, this is Card Seed Headrest. They actually developed this and released it on Steam. Um, the whole point of the game is to find Chris Lombardi, the head of Matador, and kill him. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and they did this without our involvement. Um, but, you know, <laughs> uh, we, you know, uh, we obviously uh, enjoyed uh, their approach. Um, they're on Twitch a lot, um, you know, working on music. Uh, working on demos, um, streaming. So that's another way our artists just are in the service. Arca, very engaged on, on Twitch, um, you know, and also um, through gaming. Uh, and I think the last example, it wasn't ours, but, you know, LCD Sound System partnering with Google. Um, I forgot how this one was built, but Dance Tonight. Um, you just a, another way to sort of engage with the release of a song through some creative HTML5 WebGL uh, gaming. So again, you know, that's our approach here. Um, you know, there's examples, obviously, Radiohead that did that partnership with Epic Games um, recently where they did the whole Kid A experience. Um, you know, those examples obviously are, you know, months, years in the makings and often, you know, don't really apply to our, a lot of our artists. So we try to focus on the achievable ones. And this is a good example of us having done a lot with essentially very little. Yeah, I have two pretty fun examples. One is a little bit more approachable and one is a little bit outside of the box. But um, we have an artist, Sam Beddoes, who is also a developer of one of our games um, called Angry Video Game Nerd 1 and 2 Deluxe. So basically we took um, the first game um, and the second game, put them into an all new engine and gave new content and made a deluxe version of that game. And the Angry Video Game Nerd, if you were in early YouTube, you've heard of him, you know, yelling about shitty NES games. That was his thing. Um, and, you know, he's still doing it today. And using that property to create um, these games and just seeing the success of that. Um, but the interesting part about this challenge was Sam Beddoes is not a musician. You know, he is a game developer, but he made all the music for the soundtrack of this game. So Presenting him as an artist, um, that's been a really fun challenge, but he's embraced it. Um, so that's not really as approachable for everyone in this room, unless you have some game development um, uh, chops that you want to use. But um, as far as a little bit of a more approachable way to apply that, um, we have an artist, Oreo, who made an album called Clover that was a concept album. She created a whole story around this album. Um, the whole idea, uh, she did in 2020. So it was the roaring 2020s. Um, and it was, you know, kind of 20s themed, um, a, a lecture jazz album. Um, and with that, she did like every month, she basically put out a new track that went along with this concept throughout 2020. Um, and a little over, because 2020 was crazy for all of us, right? Um, but with this, uh, she also got a small group uh, of uh, creative people together to do a game jam. And for um, non-gamers kind of here, um, a game jam is basically a set period of time where you might have set assets or, um, you know, there's different parameters. And throughout the game jam, you need to create a game from beginning to end and all of the assets for it. So she did a game jam um, to make like a, a fun little game surrounding that Clover concept and was able to promote that to her audience in that way, too, as another way to sell the album. So you don't necessarily have to participate in that development process, although if you've never done a game jam in, in, in any, it, it's hectic and beautiful. It's like <laughs> one to two days. Like, it's a weekend. It's nuts. So. But it, it was a really good way to kind of promote that release and give that a new life as she was doing it through this um, this month, or I'm sorry, year long process of, of putting out this album. And it, I, I think if she wouldn't have done 
those little things along the way, the album wouldn't have had the impact. It would have just been like, okay, well, there's this song, there's that song. Um, so yeah, if you want to take a quick coding course and throw yourself into the fire, go for it. <laughs> Thomas, I, yeah. I want to hear more about Shredder's Gen, but also like what else you've done too. Yeah, so we've um, we have a lot of labels that are creating their own games, similar to you know what Pablo is um, talking about. Uh, we actually had one artist that um, created a little mini metaverse around a single, uh, and it was really cool. You could go in as a user and kind of explore different components of the song and see you know lyrics on the wall or isolate stems. You could actually chat with other people uh, that were were in the room as well. Uh, and this was like a very small artist when we signed them, I think like, you know, two or 3,000 monthly listeners. And wow. where that's relevant, um, you know, for as it pertains to retail is we could take that information to Spotify and say like, or Apple or any of these other guys and say like, hey, look at this, like they're doing something different from just a great song. And uh, I think that, you know, it was really engaging for the DSPs to go in and, and be able to see this and say like, wow, this band is really dedicated. Uh, with outside of the metaverse, they also uh, had this crazy physical gumball machine. The song was called Gum, uh, and uh, they they put it in different areas around LA um, to promote the song. There was a QR code on it and everything, and that tied back into the metaverse. Uh, cool. Of course, someone stole the gumball machine. It's probably at the <laughs> bottom of the Pacific Ocean right now or something. But uh, yeah, but in the end, like the results, like really paid off. I mean, it was. Um, Brand new artists we hadn't worked with before. Uh, it was, you know, New Music Friday across the board, including U.S. You know, big flagship playlists, and now pretty much like everything we release from them is getting the type of pickup that you know is in line with how good the music is. And I think it just kind of, you know, helped uh, helped get the DSPs to cross that first point of actually listening to the track, uh, and so that was a lot of fun to work with. It's amazing. So I, I did have one last question, but I actually think we're running low on time. So I, before we end everything, I just want to give an opportunity. Where is the best place for any one of us to like reach you, follow you, to find out more about what you guys are doing ongoing outside of this panel? Uh, email and LinkedIn, I guess. LinkedIn, okay. Yeah, you can follow at ScreenWave Media on Twitter um, or follow me from there too. Um, and honestly, we just put together a exciting new music website that talks about what we do specifically in music, since our website is very focused on what we do with like content creators and game development and things like that. So music.screenwavemedia.com if you want to learn more. Uh, yeah, just LinkedIn is great. Uh, email as well, gavin at monstercat.com. Just feel free to reach out. I'm always down to just chat, have a quick meeting and, and ideate. Feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, Idle IO uh, on Instagram uh, for the company, or you know LinkedIn uh, for myself. And yeah, just come say hi after this, and we can exchange information. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you.